Hey, good morning, church. I was mouthing the count down there because uh, we watched Wayne's World last night. Best movie on the face of the planet. If you haven't watched it, I'm trying to think if there's any rude bits in there that I shouldn't be saying. Can you remember? It's a really old movie, those of you that are young joining us. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> you'll have to Google it. Yeah. <laughs> It's awesome. By the way, I, I remember most of the lines. I probably remember more lines from Wayne's World, I shouldn't say this, than I do scriptures. So anyway, <laughs> there you go. But we are here this morning and uh, we're ready for an incredible day in church. We're starting our series, uh, Culture Wars, and mm-hmm. you are kicking off the first of our Culture Wars. Yep but the last message that you're going to preach as a pastor here. Someone said the last message that Paul is going to preach here, but we're going to have him back as a guest speaker. Uh, Hopefully by then they'll have refined your heresies. (laughs) That's right. That's right. That'll teach the truth at (laughs) that point. Yeah. Yeah. How are you feeling? Great. It's uh, emotional. Yeah. Yeah. Emotional. It's an exciting morning. I'm excited to speak, but I'm also, uh, I know what I'm leaving. I love this community and all of you. And so it's a bittersweet in so many ways. Yeah. Yeah. And you're leading us in communion this morning yes. as well. Yeah, so, what a privilege. Yeah. Yeah. So make sure you have your, your communion emblems ready at the end of the service. We're going to be doing that. And uh, it's actually one of the things. It's actually <laughs> Good to see you. so rude, people. So <laughs> rude. But it, over the next six weeks, I think it is, we're going to be doing communion every single week. Because mm. the theme is culture wars, but it's actually about bringing everything back to Jesus. Mm. And so have your communion ready for all of those times as well. Anything, any last words? <laughs> yeah, no last words, yeah. No, just exciting. I, I would echo what you just said, Pastor John, that communion, the Lord's Supper, brings us with all our tensions into the, into the room together and yeah. unites us over the one who unites us, yep. Jesus. And so yep. I'm excited for that and I'm looking forward to the series. Cool. So get ready for it and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. See Bye. Ya.
search us, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before. for your presence, Lord. Let us fix our eyes, continue to fix our eyes on you, Jesus. We welcome you here in this place, our bridegroom. I just want to speak the name of Jesus.
go into something, we go into a job, we go into an environment with an expectation. You go to a, a nice restaurant and your expectation is that you will have good service and good food. And sometimes we can come into the house of God with our own preconceived ideas of who God is and we have our expectations. I don't know what your expectation of God is this morning but I just want to speak one verse over us and it's Psalm 119 verse 68 you are good and you do good things see the problem is is that when I say the word good there are expectations even around that word we society has lowered what good means it's just just slightly above satisfactory, but well below great. That's not God. See, that word good is tov. And it's in the widest meaning. It's beautiful. It's in beauty. It's above expectations. It's above and beyond. So I don't know what you expect of God. But can I just encourage you as we sing this next song? understand that God is good and he does good things maybe you've had a sense of God doesn't recognize me God doesn't know me God ignores me or God doesn't even know who I am God is good and he does good things when we sing this next song I want you to declare it declare it as truth you might not Initially, fully embrace it. But as we keep declaring it, as we keep declaring the goodness of God, firstly, we begin to believe it. And then we begin to encourage others to believe that as well. God knows your, situ God knows your situation. He is good. He's good. Not an average not a slightly above average, but well above and beyond anything that we could dream or imagine. So come on, as the team sing this next song, as we together sing this next song, let's declare the goodness of God.
platform in this moment prays over you. There's no you and me, there's us. And this is about a moment where we pray together. We have so many needs represented both in, in this room and, and online as well. People watching in the moment and then later on in the week. We're, even though people are praying and watching later on, we're praying with them. You see, we've got needs coming in that are representing relationships, either broken or fractured. Or people even praying into, God, I, I, I want a life partner. It's, it's okay to pray for that stuff. We want to stand with you. We don't need to know it. But what we do want to be able to do is pray together as a community. So as we pray, one of the things that we do here is just acknowledge our need before God. You might be praying into a relationship. You might be praying into health needs, whether that's physical or mental health needs. You might be praying into financial stuff that's going on in your life at the moment. This is us. So as we pray, if you see someone that's got their hand in the air, why don't you just stretch out your hand towards them? If you're near them, and it's okay for you to do so, you can just put your hand on their shoulder. You know, the reason we do that, there's nothing in this moment spiritual about that. But when someone's going through a tough time, what's the first thing you do? You reach out. You touch them and say, I'm with you in this. One of the things that the last two years has denied us is that physical touch. We need it. So we pray as a community. We pray for each other. We pray with each other. So if you've got need right now, just stretch out, reach up your hand, and other people will see it. You don't have to tell them what it is. But let's just begin to pray. Come on, church. This is a thing that we do as a community. People putting their hands up all over the place. Come on. Let's pray. Reach out to someone. It might be someone that you know across the other side of the room. Let's reach out and pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Father, you see hands raised. You see hands reaching out towards other people. We acknowledge you in our prayers, but we also acknowledge each other in our prayers. Pray for those that are dealing with broken relationships. We pray for those that are wanting relationships. We pray into financial situations. You are our provider. You're the restorer of relationships. You are the healer. You are the God that sees and the God that hears. We thank you for that, God. This isn't an exercise that we do as a church. This is us, your community, reaching out to you acknowledging you in every single need we thank you for that in the name of Jesus amen amen fantastic hey you can grab your seats if you're a guest with us this morning we would firstly want to welcome you whether it's in the room or online and uh, you might want to fill out one of our connection cards or even if you're here and you've filled out a connection card before but some of your details have changed make sure you update us so that we can uh, keep you informed of what's going on in the life of our church as well. We've got a lot to do and be part of this morning. And I want to make sure that we give the Word of God plenty of time. But before we head into that, I want to encourage us in our giving. Malachi 3 verse 10. And this is a, probably one of the most well-known and well-used verses in terms of our giving and how we do it. It says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, says the Lord. And it goes on. But I just want us to think about that phrase, that there may be food in my house. You know, over the past, since we've moved, and probably even before that, but since we've moved into our new house, kids are in and out of our house, probably even more so during the holidays, but they come in and one kid has now has feels he has refrigerator rights you know what that is don't you don't even ask to ask now he just goes to the fridge and picks out something Judah brings all his friends around and it's like oh this kid's staying for tea so he's frantically trying to feed the 5,000 and make two small fish I hate fish uh, and bread go a lot further than she thought it had to but you see there's this thing about being hospitable there should always be more 
that we have within us so that we can be hospitable to those coming in. Food is not just about having something to eat. It's about saying to the homeless, we can help you, put, we can put you up. It's about saying to, to those on overseas missions, we can support you in what you do in seeing people saved. And I want to talk more about that at a different day. But that's something we're heading into. It's about saying to, to the drug addict, we can support you through rehab. It's about saying to, to, to blended families, we can, we can help you by doing courses and series and set environments that will help you deal with all of this stuff that you didn't know you had to deal with before. It's not just about bread and fish. It's about having resources within the house. So as you're not just giving to a church. Firstly, you're giving to God, but you're also giving into an environment that says we've got food in our house and it doesn't matter. Bring another kid in. We can feed them. We can clothe them. We can teach them. We can build them. Is that okay? Can I pray over our giving together as we give? On the screen behind me, you'll see different ways to give. And if you want to give later on, just make sure you go to the, the information desk. And if you're sort of in and out of the lake, We haven't discovered our own the lake yet, but we've discovered a few the lakes. So we're, we're making our way around the lake. And uh, so, but if you're away, can you just make sure that you set up the, the direct giving uh, resource that we have? That's a, you know, it's a great thing for us to be able to do. But let me pray. Father God, I thank you that there is food in your house. And uh, God, even, even with the flood, God, we, we don't want to turn people away. We want to be able to resource we want to have resources in the house so that we can feed and clothe and grow people within this environment. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, have I forgotten anything? Because you usually tell me. Your mind's in other places at the moment. It is Paul's last Sunday. And I know he's, he always spends a good amount of time preparing the word, preparing the meal for us. And I want to encourage us as to be a church that, that actually absorbs that. Whoever's speaking, you know, get your notebooks. If you've never taken notes before, start now. Get your phone out. Get your notebook out. I've got an electron. I like writing. I don't like writing, but it helps me if I write it down. So I've got a, a thing that I use as well. But get your notebooks out. Take some notes. This next Six or seven weeks, we've got a, a series, and Paul's going to unpack the first one, but called Culture Wars. And uh, we decided to do this quite a while ago, just to hit some of the major questions or major themes that are happening in the world, and, and that I guess other people ask us as Christians as well. How do you, how do you deal with this? How, how's that? And I was sort of thinking about, what does that mean to us? Anyone remember the account of Solomon and the two women that brought a baby. Interesting account that, isn't it? It's quite macabre when you think about it. This two women bring a baby and, and it's actually one of the women's, but both are claiming the baby and Solomon holds the baby up and says, okay, what I'll do, I'll chop it in half and I'll give you both a bit. So here's the problem. We've allowed, when the baby is ours, we've allowed someone someone that doesn't own it, someone that isn't mothering it, someone that doesn't care for it, to allow our baby, our culture, the things that we hold close to us to be chopped in half. Solomon, the wisdom of Solomon, knows that the real mother is going to say, no, 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 give it to the other woman. But too often in big topics, we've allowed other people to chop us in half. To divide us where we don't need to be divided. There may, I know in this room that there are a wide variety of opinions, perspectives, and thinking on many, many things. And that's okay. Do you know that's okay? Do you know that's okay? You can nod with me. You can say, yes, John. It's okay to have that. We don't need to divide the baby like the world does. And one of the things that I want us to keep thinking about, and this is why we're going to be doing communion every single week that we hit one of these topics. Why? Because we want to come back to Jesus. 
You see, when we come around the table of the Lord, when we come around communion, the breaking of bread, whatever term we use, it should bring us together, not divide us. Why? Because we're centered on the one thing, the one person that is grace and truth. And that's Jesus. So at the end of every topic, whether we're divided, whether you've got more questions at the end of it than at the beginning of it, it's okay because we bring it back to Jesus. Paul, why don't you come? And some of you may have noticed it's a bit colder in here than it normally is. And the reason for that, let me just explain. If you didn't know, I'm now a TV star and you have to pay to speak to me. I did a news report. If you haven't seen it, I can show it over and over and over again. But we had a flood, and uh, it was all down here. And so one of the things that we were told, and, and the, rest of the, uh, d- uh, the rest of this floor as well, one of the things we were told, we have to keep it colder so that the water goes. We have to heat it, but we also have to keep it cold. That's why it's probably a bit colder in here than it normally would be. And uh, you might see some kids running around as well. We don't have our kids program going on today. Parents... If you've got younger children, you're quite welcome to take them to King's Kids, where we've got set up a live stream room in there for you. But it's okay. If you want to stay in here, we're with you. At least uh, Paul can shout and speak over the noise of kids, can't you, Paul? Absolutely. Is that good? Yeah. Fantastic. Hey, I'm going to hand over to Paul right now. Awesome. Thank you, John. You did forget one thing, to have them greet each other, but uh, why don't we just take a second, just greet one another, welcome each other to to church. (laughs) I get to say that one last thing, John. It is good to see or to hear that kind of greeting and murmuring and welcoming each other into this community. Um, Today is the last time I get to say my name is Paul. I'm one of the pastors at Circle. And it's a joyful and bittersweet moment as I get to share one of my last messages as a pastor here at Circle. Oh, man. So if I get a little bit emotional, if the message seems a little clunky, or if I go places where you're wondering, why is he talking about that, or why is he pausing awkwardly, it's just because I'm awkward. <laughs> no, it's because I'm also emotional and all that kind of stuff. So it is an exciting day, and it's, it's just good to look around and see all of you here and all of you joining online. I know it is the long weekend, so many are enjoying the lake somewhere, but they all promised me they were going to tune in, so good to see you online as well. Today we are starting a brand new series, which I'm excited about. Uh, We're calling it Culture Wars. There's a great graphic behind me. Um, But when we start a new series and when we have a title like this, it's probably wise to actually define it and talk about a little bit what we mean when we say Culture Wars. John had a really good uh, preamble here for us about it. Um, But what do we mean when we say Culture Wars? In fact, when you see the graphic behind me, there's a little bit of a division, and there's images in your mind, I am sure, that are coming up, things that you agree about, and things that you know other people disagree with you about. So simply put, culture wars, what we mean by that is we say what a culture war is, is a cultural conflict between two social groups or more, and the struggle for dominance of one group's values, beliefs, and practices over another, right? So I think the struggle for dominance is a really good phrase. I know it's a really good phrase because I looked it up in the Wikipedia, and that's what it said. And, uh, but I think it describes it really well because there's, in our culture, in, in culture wars, we have sides that believe they are correct, right? We believe that we are, I believe, what I believe is right, and those that don't think the way I do must be wrong. And so there's a dominance of me wanting to share my opinion as the right opinion over the other person's opinion, belief, value, practice, methodology, because I think what I believe is right. So there is a struggle of dominance of what we think is right compared to somebody else. So again, what we mean by culture war is disagreement about topics which can polarize us 
in values, in beliefs, and, and the polarization could develop and grow. And sometimes we even describe these kind of polarizations or these culture wars as hot button topics, right? We describe them as that because temperature tends to rise when we are fighting for the thing that we believe in or we're talking about the thing we believe in and somebody disagrees with us and temperatures can rise and we call them the hot button issues. And often those are the things like, right, if you are um, married or if, uh, or if you're part of a larger family and you tend to go somewhere for a holiday, there are hot button issues that you know you probably shouldn't raise because it's going to create some uncomfortable conversations, right? So you're having that drive and, you, and your spouse might say something, hey, I know they might say this about that, but just keep your cool. Just nod and be nice, right? There's hot button issues. Is, is that only my family? Nobody else's? <laughs> right? Okay. So we have, we have things that we are like, okay, I know I'm going to disagree about this, but I'm going to be polite about it and all that kind of stuff. And all these hot button issues have existed since the dawn of mankind. There's differences, there's wars, there's borders, there's all things that happen. But certainly over locally, Certainly over the last two years, our country, our province, our city has had a share of hot button issues, right? This is the part where Pastor John would say, can I get an amen? amen. All right, all right. There you go, John. I asked for an amen <laughs> just for you. Uh, anyways, we, ha we have all in one shape or form wrestled with opinions, values, beliefs, and how to practice them specifically in the last two years or three years of this pandemic, kind of figuring out who's right, who's wrong, what should I do, what shouldn't I do, and we've come to these kind of divisions. That's been our ethos over the last little while. And we're all maybe even sick of it a bit because we're tired of arguments, we're tired of all these hot button things, but it's been part of us. And before I really jump into today's topic for us, I think it's important to highlight just one more thing as we talk about culture wars. The reason we believe our own opinions, our own facts, our own positions on any value or situation, the reason I believe my position is correct is because I believe that what I believe is genuinely right. The reason you believe what you believe to be the, the, the issue that you stand for, the belief that you, that you ground yourself in, the, the topic that you say this is the right way to do things is because you actually believe that it's true. We believe it's the best way of living, the best way of thinking, the best situation for us. Therefore, it becomes a hot topic because we want to defend it. I say this to make a point that we often position the other side, the other people on the other side of the argument as some kind of malevolent, evil, uh, hateful people. They're not like us. That's why they disagree with us. Which, and this will be alarming, which is actually mostly, broadly speaking, typically just not true. The person on the other side of your argument is predominantly not evil, malevolent, or hateful person. They likely hold their position because they believe they're right. And they likely hold it because they believe it's the right thing for their community. And I know you have scenarios coming up in your mind right now, and you're thinking like, well, okay, on some things, but on this thing, that must be malevolent. And maybe there's things like that out there. Maybe there's people like that. But broadly speaking, the person in your community, the person that you rub shoulders with daily that you disagree about things is likely not a malevolent evil person. They're just somebody who thinks what they think is right. Whether they are right or wrong is the side of this part that I'm bringing up. I believe, I'm just making a point here that the other people on the other side believe what they believe because they think it's right. So... Caricaturing people does no justice in any conversation or debate. In fact, it actually closes any opportunity for you to be heard or understood, right? In fact, best thing you can do in any kind of conversation or debate, the best thing you can do is understand the argument of the other person so well that when you recite it back to them, when you say, is this what you believe? And without any character uh, mocking or any kind of tone or sar sarcasm, speak out what they believe so well that the other person can say, yeah, that is what I believe. 
What that does, it actually builds a bridge for us in any of these conversations that we're going to be talking about over this month. It actually builds a bridge of sympathy and empathy because if you understand the other person so well, they can actually, that can actually create room for you to share what you believe. So please, as we enter these conversations of culture, culture wars and hot topics, please resist the temptation to mock, to caricature, to call names of the person on the other side of you. The person that God calls his image bearer, right? So that's, that's just kind of the baseline for us as we enter these topics. So today's hot topic for us in cultural conversation is the problem of pain, the problem of suffering and evil in the world. Now, the problem of evil is the question of how to reconcile the existence of evil and suffering with an omnipotent, that it's all-powerful, omnibenevolent, that is possessing unlimited goodness, all-loving, all-kind God, and omniscient, all-knowing God. How do we reconcile that there's suffering, pain, and evil in this world when there's this good, loving, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-strong all God? How do we come to that reconciliation? And before you answer things, because I'm sure you have answers, some of you have wrestled with this problem, others of you maybe have ignored it. How do you wrestle with this? I do want to say this thing, that this is in fact the best argument of all against the idea of divine goodness. It really is. Better than failures of church, people, brokenness, mistakes, sins, this is probably the best idea against the all-good divine person. In fact, so good that philosophers and thinkers and, and pastors over time have come to these different, different solutions for this problem of evil. They say things like, well, yeah, there's God, like, ha things have to be created, but maybe God, what he did is he wound things up, and he, like, started the, the world and the universe, and he just stepped back and said, hey, let them figure it out. I'm just going to be, I'm just going to kind of watch from afar, right? Like, people have come with conclusions of, like, that must be what, if there's God, how he operates, because why is there evil? Why does it exist if there's a good God? Again, as I'm saying all those things, it might be triggering you to think of different, different outcomes, different solutions, different answers. And I'm just going to invite you to suspend those for a second. I'm not saying they're not good. They might be the best ones yet. I don't know. But just suspend those for a little bit and, and let's just go with this journey with me as we kind of unpack what is, how does, why does evil and suffering exist? Now, one of our tools I'm going to recommend, I'm going to recommend two tools today. So the first one, there's going to be a QR code that's going to come up behind me. It's for a video called The Day of the Lord from the Bible Project people. It's just an amazing resource. These guys unpack the scriptures in short videos where they take characters, narratives, themes, um, literary styles of the Bible and just unpack and explain things for us. And I believe this video, Day of the Lord, is just an excellent resource, excuse me, that helps us Come to terms with understanding where our world is at and where it's going. So if you have your phone, uh, QR code's there, just you, you put it on your camera. This is my IT part here. You point at it, a link will come up. Click on the link and just bookmark it for, to watch it this afternoon or on Monday. But please do that. Now, if you're on an awkward angle where you're just not catching the QR code, it, is, it will be on our website, so you can grab it there. But do take a second to do that. It's an amazing resource and thus excellent stuff to help us in this conversation. So now that you've done that, what we'll do today is we'll kind of focus our conversation in a very famous passage in Romans chapter 8. Uh, Romans is a letter that Apostle Paul is writing. It's just thick, thick letter of just incredible stuff. It's hard to understand in parts. In fact, Peter and other disciples like, who can even understand how Paul writes? Like he said that about Paul. So if you have a hard time with Romans, it's okay. We're going to unpack it a little bit, just a chapter, just a small passage of it. But what we see being introduced in this letter, coming up to this chapter, is from about chapter 5, Apostle Paul is beginning to develop this idea that God is actually creating a new humanity. And that's a really important theme. Not like new humanity apart from us. He is inviting all of us into this new humanity that he's developing through and because of Jesus. And to explain what this new humanity is and why there's a need for it, Apostle Paul starts with the person of Adam, the first human. And from chapter 5 on, he builds on this idea how, um, how Adam had a choice. And he was put into this garden this, where things were ordered and just good. 
And Adam himself was very good. And Adam's choice was to choose disobedience to a set order of creation. And what Apostle Paul is saying is that the good creation, including humanity, which is very good, begins to be corrupted by the choices that Adam makes. But not just a choice of biting an apple, as you may have read in the story, you're kind of remembering the Genesis story, that's part of it, but that's the real disobedience there, if you read carefully, the real disobedience, and Paul begins to parallel this in Romans, the real disobedience is actually Adam choosing to determine for himself what is good and evil. That's a really important part to catch here. In other words, the serpent, the temper that comes to Adam and Eve, what, what, he, what he tempts Adam and Eve into is suggesting that choose for yourself. Choose something different. You'll be like God. Why are you, why are you limited in this, in, this, in this order that God has given you? By choosing this, you will be like God's. And so Adam's first move of disobedience is actually saying, I will decide what is good and what is evil. It's interesting to know that the created order that that they're rebelling from, one where humanity doesn't have to actually prove itself to anything. Everything is good. And it's good, we know that, because God says it's good. And humanity is very good. We know that because God says this is very good. There's nothing for the humans to prove. There's nothing for them to achieve. There's no way to show their, their utility in this world. They're actually good and in a good place. And we know this because what God does for them is after humanity is created, as described by the sixth day, their next act of service is what? To rest. The first things that humans are given by God is a Sabbath, the seventh day. The first action that humanity has out of this good order isn't, okay, now prove yourself that you're worthy, prove that you're my good children, prove what you can do. No, the first act of service that humanity receives is to rest, to feast with God, to be in his presence who's also resting. And we should ponder on that, that the first act that God invites humanity into is rest and feast. That's a whole different sermon. Humanity still rebels, and the result is a broken relationship. And violence is introduced very quickly into the scriptures. Very quickly. In fact, if you're, if you're a Bible reader and you read Genesis, it's like, this is a great poem, these things are nice, but then Adam and Eve do these things, and all of a sudden, it just starts to escalate. Like, it goes crazy fast. And there's a corruption that's introduced and violence that's introduced. And not only human, humans are corrupted, but creation itself, earth itself, is corrupted into decay and disorder because of these choices that humanity has made. Death enters reality. And not just it enters reality. Death is now used to gain power over and over and over. Violence and sword become the norm. In fact, violence is used to create some sort of set of peace, some sort of rules. Violence actually begins to be used to create peace. It's the world we know. And Paul is now, in his letter, drawing a picture of this new humanity that, that can come out of Adam and because of Jesus become new Jesus like humans, justified by faith in Jesus Christ. So there's lots going on that Apostle Paul is explaining in the chapters, leading us to our chapter as he's leading us into this passage. But on top of that, Paul's own reality as he's writing this is his context is that he's living in this ancient Israel, which is occupied by this Roman Empire, this brutal military power that's using violence and war to bring peace. So much so, they actually minted it on their coins. They called it Pax Romana. Pax Romana, Roman peace, peace by the means of the sword. Interesting connection. Adam's disobedience leads to violence, and violence is used to create peace. But Israel, in light of this, inside of this, says we have a hope. Long ago, they promised the Messiah, someone who would come and lead them out of the oppression into true freedom. Jesus of Nazareth shows up and begins performing miracles and speaking of new kingdom, the kingdom of God. And many people think this, this is the man who will lead them to war against Romans. 
He will maybe lead Pax Romana, but in a different way. He will lead us by sword, by toppling the empire, by toppling Caesar, by creating this new Israel nation that will be powerful. But instead, Jesus goes to war with entirely different methods and with something else entirely, which brings us to chapter 8, um, which could be titled, Life on God's Terms. Adam chose a life on his terms, but here Paul is unpacking what life could look like on God's terms. Paul begins the chapter unpacking the resurrected life in Jesus and through Jesus, the arrival of his spirit, that the we are justified by faith in Christ alone. And then we jump in into verse 18, chapter 8. We read, I consider that our present suffering are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation awaits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Paul unpacks with us with this point that even creation, all the earth is suffering in this disordered way of being. Paul reminds us of the troubled state of this present world, for the creation awaits in eager expectation. He draws a great picture um, with this, this poetic vision. He sees all nature waiting for the glory that shall be. Now creation is in bondage and decay, but not forever. Verse 20. For creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. The creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. The world is one where beauty fades, loveliness decays. It is a dying world, but it is waiting for its liberation from all of this, and it's coming in the state of glory Verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we, we ourselves who have first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption to daughtership, sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Paul is aware and makes a point that the present pain is here. There's suffering here. And through the Spirit of God, we anticipate actually something new because we have received the Spirit of God because of that we anticipate. It's when people accept, Paul is saying, their identity as Jesus-like humans that they are liberated to become the wholehearted humans who can truly love God and their neighbor. For in this hope, verse 24, we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all, but hope for what they are, who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So a few things we should be aware of when Paul is, what Paul is, the, the picture he's painting for us. He's working with the ideas that Jewish people of that time would recognize and understand very easily. For us, some of these themes are like, like when you read Romans in NIV in English translation, it feels clunky sometimes. Like it feels like, okay, I think I know what you're saying, Paul, but then you keep repeating things over and over, and I'm not sure if that's what you're, what you're grasping at. But Paul is connecting to an idea that would have been understood. He talks of this present age and of the glory that will be made known. Okay? This age, and there's a glory to come. The reason he's doing this, and the reason that's actually a really deep part of Christian thinking, because of Paul and Jesus, the reason is part of this is because the Jewish people thought in a divided time. This was part of their context and their culture. They've always thought in two, uh, in divided time into two sections, the present age and the age to come. So when you hear the kind of language in the, in the letters, in the gospels, in the Bible, the, the age and the age to come, this is how Israelites saw the world. And the reason he's doing this is because Jewish people thought uh, the divided time will happen. It wasn't just a theory. It was like, well, now, but something better. He, they actually believed this is how things were going to work. So the present age is subjected to sin and death and suffering and pain, but there will be a time when this will be no more. For Paul, Jesus is that bridge. Jesus is the person who makes this possible, that someday the day of the Lord will arrive. So this is important for me. So again, I'll just go back to the Bible Project. I hope you got the QR code. If you didn't, it is on our website. That the foundations of the world will be shaken, and out of it will come a new world. Notice the process of thinking here. The judgment was not necessarily how we often understand judge with the law and the, and the court and, 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 and lawyers and the you know, judge in front of us. 
maybe part of it, but that's not really what's being shaken out here. What is being explained to us there, that there'll be, the focus is that there'll be a renewal of the world, which is, again, great Jewish thinking, renewal of things that will arrive. And we know this is true because the passage that we read in Isaiah, now often when we hear this passage, we think of revelations or revelation because we, we often hear it in that context, but it's, John's actually quoting Isaiah, which says, see, I will create new heavens and new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. The dream of the renewed world was dear to the Jewish people, and Paul knows that. And now in Romans, he writes this idea out on, uh, to explain that he endows creation, even in, like this is such poetic language here, endows it with consciousness. He thinks of nature longing for the day when sin dominions would be broken, death and decay would be gone, and God's glory would come. With this touch of imagination and this insight, he says the state of nature was even worse. It was even worse for nature than it was for humans because human beings actually sinned. They actually chose this deliberately. For nature, it was involuntary. It was subjected to the consequences of the choices the humans made. Think about that. Nature's decay, this state of being, is involuntary. It was what has happened because of the choices humanity has made. Hold that thought with you as we go through this. And then Paul proclaims, but we are saved by this hope, this blazing truth, this, this, this fire that lights Paul's life. The, the human situation is not hopeless. It is justified and driven by faith in Jesus, which will result in glorious hope to come. So for Paul, life is not this... You know, this, not this Eeyore, you know what I'm talking about, Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore, this, who's always like, everything's the worst, you know, this is a nice house, but not that nice, you know, all that kind of stuff. For Paul, he's not in this permanent despair waiting for the end of the world to encomp- be encompassed by sin, death, and decay, but rather life that's eager in anticipation of the liberation, a renewal, a recreation, a resurrection brought by the glory and the power of God through and in Jesus Christ. In verse 19, he uses a wonderful word for eager expectation. The Greek word here is apokaradokia, which is like a crazy word to say. (laughs) I'm going to try to say it again. Apokaradokia. Just remember that. It's a cool word. And what, you know, when you have like words in your native tongue, if you speak other languages and then you're like, try to explain the heart of the word, he just doesn't do it in another language. This is why I'm bringing this word up. The eager expectation doesn't do the justice to this word. What Paul uh, is describing here is a person like leaning forward, looking at the dawn, just awaiting, like they're stretched, like they're eagerly waiting for that dawn to arrive. They're, they're that excited. They're searching the distance for signs of the dawn, the daybreak of glory happening. So to Apostle Paul, life is not weary. He's not defeated. It is a vivid expectation. And Paul reminds us that we are involved in this human situation, the very real painful decay part of life, with an joyful anticipation of what's to come because of Jesus. We eagerly anticipate. And we do that because like something in us, whatever we believe, if you're new here and you're not even sure what to do with this whole Jesus story or Paul's talking about me or the apostle, What's interesting for us is no matter what we believe or don't believe, there's something in us that seems to ache and say there's got to be more. Like death can't have the last say, can it? Like that suffering, it just isn't right, is it? There's something in us that says there's something more. There's this hope in light of evil, despite of suffering, that's just percolating inside of us. So where does that come from? And what are we hearing is my solution to problem of evil and suffering pain is just to be hopeful? Well, things will get better. Not quite. Back in the Soviet era in 1970s, the Russian author Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, speaking of the evil he was experiencing and saw, seeing the divide, dividing lines between the West and the East, us and them, uh, the adages, proclamations of who's right on the right side of history and who isn't, in the sight of all the terror the communist regime was spreading through the, through the half of the world, In light of all that, he wrote this. If only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere, you know, out there insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and to destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts to the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own 
Alexander agrees that pain and suffering is not just a removed force in the world, but lives in us by the choices we make, like Adam. The decay of creation in nature is in all of us. So self-examination of our motives, our intentions, is the first step that we must, must go through. What is your intention when you want to debate? What is your motivation when you see somebody else on the other side of you as evil? What is in your heart? This is an important step of growth and maturity, self-examination. The second is, I would say, uh, when confronted with catastrophes of nature, when, catastrophe, when, when confronted with death and unfairness of illness and seeing loved ones die, we shouldn't simply explain them away as some weird good, but rather groan with creation as we wait for renewal of all things. We change our postures to suffering well with others. Understanding that evil is absence of good, and the only way to deal with evil is to do good. David Bentley Hart, theologian, speaker, writer, philosopher, has an excellent book. This is my second resource I'm going to recommend. It's a book called The Doors of the Sea. I don't have a QR code for it, so write it down. The Doors of the Sea by David Bentley Hart. David writes about the tsunami that happened in Asia in 2004. He says this, Considering the scope of the catastrophe and of the agonies and sorrows it had visited on so many, we should probably have all remained silent for a while. The claim to discern some greater meaning, or for that matter, meaninglessness, behind the contingencies of history and nature is both cruel and presumptuous at such times. Pious platitudes and words of comfort seem not only futile and banal, but almost blasphemous. Metaphysical disputes come perilously close to mocking the dead. So what do we do? What do we do with all of this? What do we do with the suffering that's just simply so unfair? And how do we avoid giving platitudes and simple answers to complex questions, knowing that these platitudes and, and easy answers can actually do more damage than good? And what do we do with the fact that good and evil actually cuts through our own hearts? What is our response as a church? I want to suggest a couple of things couple of things that we can learn from Apostle Paul in his letter to Romans, specifically chapter 8. First is to the question of pain and suffering. Pain and suffering is that biblical story tells us it exists because creation was offset by humanity's choices. Suffering and, and pain exists because choices were made. This should matter to us because we should consider how our choices today are adding to pain and suffering of others. And what can we do to alleviate that pain and suffering of others? We have a part to play in how we respond and choose in everyday life. New humanity that Apostle Paul is teaching us about, this new way of living, this Jesus-like life, is about participating with Jesus, with God, in work of redemption of this world, in the now, while awaiting the hope and glory to come. We actually have an active part to play in the reconciliation, renewal, and resurrection, and hope. Jesus actually set a template for us. He didn't just do a bunch of things, took off, and said, believe in me. Is that blasphemous to say? He actually invited us into a life. He said, carry your cross. Follow me. He invited us into a participation with him in faith, in belief in him, for sure. But living like new Jesus community, we have a purpose and a mission. The second important takeaway of the problem of evil and suffering for us from Apostle Paul is what's God's response to pain and suffering in this world and around us? God's response is to enter pain and suffering. 
to live in a broken world with a decaying body and enter death so death could be defeated. God's response to pain and suffering is to become like one of us, to suffer, to suffer well, to defeat death so that we could have life everlasting. It is a way for us to be renewed, reconciled, made right, not by our work, not by anything that we present, but through and in Jesus Christ. Jesus of Nazareth comes to solve the problem of evil, not by sword, but by love and sacrifice. And our response is like on the sixth day for Adam is to hope, rejoice, and rest in him. We are invited into a feast. We are invited into peace. We are invited into his presence to rest. We aren't invited to save ourselves. We aren't invited to prove ourselves. We're invited to rest in Jesus. And through Jesus, become to live the template he set for us. Just one more thought. Our pain at the immorality and an injustice and the suffering and evil in our world that we see all the time, and no matter what your belief system is in this room, our, our pain and our hate that this suffering actually exists is a clue that something better and moral must exist. We spur against it despite humanity living in this suffering reality as long as we know the suffering has, and death has existed, as long as we know. And yet we spur against this reality of suffering because something in us is created of an awareness of something moral and better and good. It's a post sign to God's good creation in us and around us. We push against it because something in us tells us that this, not, this is not the way things should be. In the end, this, difficult, this is a difficult topic. And I will say there's no perfect answer. And I believe maybe we're not actually called to find an answer in this topic. But what Apostle Paul invites us into is to see divine goodness and his response to suffering by entering suffering and now inviting us to suffer well with others, inviting us to evaluate how do we add to suffering of others, asking us to see how we can alleviate the suffering of others. While Jesus loves us, cares for us, surrounds us, and supports us. What Jesus invites us is in this age is to be people of hope, people of comfort, people who step into other people's pain and bring relief, people of justice, people who fight for justice in any way they can. Jesus invites us to rest with him. Now, what I'm going to do and what we have been doing here at Circle is I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads right now. And maybe for you, you've loved Jesus your whole life. You grew up in the church. You've made the decision. And, you, and, and this is a great moment for you to spur to be like Jesus in, in light of suffering. But maybe for others of you, this is a new thing. And you're like, just like, yeah, there is something in me that hates suffering. Maybe this is a sign. Maybe this is a clue that God is good. And I want to give you an opportunity to invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life. To be the one who gives you life, who gives you rest and who invites you into a feast with him. And as Darcy comes up, I just want to invite you into this moment. I'm going to do a prayer, and if, it's, if this is you, if you're wrestling with this decision, you're thinking, yeah, I want Jesus to be, I want, I want him to be the Lord of my life. I want to step into this kind of hopeful way of, of, of living, that I look to the horizon, that I look to the dawn of hope arriving. If this is you, would you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, Thank you for stepping into suffering and pain. Thank you, Jesus, that you did that for me so that through you and in you, I can have life, life everlasting. Forgive me for how I've lived or how I've maybe been aimless, but Jesus, I invite you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I invite you to, to take control of the chaos that I've been part of and bring order to my life. I thank you for being so good, and I thank you for being here with me. I pray this all in your name. Amen.
Amen. If you made that decision, let's just give him a hand if you've made that decision today. And if you did, please don't hold it to yourself. Pastor John said so well just earlier that it's not you or I here, it's us. So let somebody know. Come to the information desk. We'd love to gift you a Bible. We want to begin this journey with you. We want to travel this road together that has bumps and bruises as we wait for the age to come. Now today we're going to have the honor of leading us through communion. Now if you didn't get one of these elements, we, we got extra ones. So just raise your hand and one of the ushers will come in and get you. Uh, I see some hands here and here. We'll get you some of these uh, <laughs> elements of juice and bread. Now the reason this is so significant for us, and I love that we're doing this every Sunday as we look at hot topics and as we look at hard conversations. I know in this room, and Pastor John said this earlier as well, there are people who think differently on different issues. But what communion does is it brings us to our focal point of the one who unites us and gives us life, and that's Jesus Christ. You see, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was in a room with his students, the people he thought he could trust. But in that room with a bunch of people who, were, who had polit different political ideas, there were people there that were saying, I'm all for you, Jesus, but just a few days later, we're going to deny that he even knew him. There was a person in that room who was going to, who has already betrayed Jesus to be arrested, to be crucified. And Jesus, knowing all of this, all of that tension with his own students, invites them into this Passover meal and says, take this bread, and if you open this first part, you can take out the wafer. And he says, this bread will represent my body, which will be broken for you. I will enter suffering for you because I'm not a far-removed God. I'm not a God that doesn't care. I'm an intimate God who cares about these things. So I will enter suffering and death, and my body will be broken for you. So whenever you eat this bread, you will remember my body broken for you. Would you break the wafer and eat it? In the same manner, he took the cup and said, this cup represents my blood. It represents a new agreement, a new promise that I'm making for you. You've lived in li life of law and life of Adam, and I'm bringing to you a new humanity, a new promise that through this blood you will be saved. Through, my, through me, you will be saved. So whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death and his return. You proclaim his death, and you proclaim that he will come back. So let's remember Jesus as we drink the cup. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you did not ignore suffering and pain, but that you entered it so we could have life. In this meal that we partake together, we thank you for being in our midst, we thank you for being in us and ahead of us and above us, below us and behind us. We thank you that you have provided a way for us to come to glory and hope with you. Thank you, Jesus, for your life in our midst. Thank you for your spirit that you have given to us now as we await your return. We praise in your name. Amen. follow Jesus, whether it's the first time or maybe it's a, a decision to reconnect to the family. We'd love to connect with you after the service. It's the privilege that we have as a community to, uh, to do the journey of following Jesus together. And uh, can I give you a bit of advice as well, whether you're in the room or whether you're watching online, keep turning up. It's amazing what happens when you place yourself in a great environment among great people. And uh, God helps us grow in that. And we want to help you with some tools. The first one is we want to give you a Bible if you haven't got one already. So maybe speak to one of the team at the back at the information desk and say, hey, I made that decision today. And we'll help you on that journey. But the other thing I would say is go out and tell someone. Because it does something in you and you never know 
what it will do in them as well. Hey, before we, uh, before we finish, we've gonna, got a couple of more things, but why don't we show our appreciation for Paul for kicking off our culture wars. Paul, Jessica, why don't you come up? Niels and Chris, if you guys could come up as well. I'm not good at this stuff. I need my wife here. Dee, will you come up as well? Today we, I guess we bid, bid, fare, bid farewell. And uh, Paul said, uh, he, he's, he made this comment this morning, oh, this is the last time I get to preach here. No, it's not. It's the last time as one of our staff pastors, but as Arnold Schwarzenegger said, <laughs> slightly misphrased, he'll be back. <laughs> Why? Because he was a pastor here? No. Because he's a great friend. And uh, I honor what he's brought to this church. And I'm excited to, to see what he brings to Lakeview as well. They need, they're a great church and need the stabilizing force that Paul brings. And I think for me, I was, you know, we were challenged in, in a just in our team meeting this morning. What's one word that you could say about Paul? I'm thinking there's so many. And one word that's really difficult, but just as we're standing here, I think the word for me, stabilizing, is a great word. There's so many other things, but I think that's what he will. And I, I want to prophesy this. Whatever, I don't use that word. I use the word sparingly, but I want to prophesy this. Speak life into your, sta- both of you, into your stabilizing force into Lakeview. You've been that for D and I and for the church over this period of time. And uh, I'm, I'm believing that you're going to bring that to Lakeview as well. They are great friends and I'm excited about, you know, you beginning to lead the team there and getting to know Curtis and some of the guys there as well. But we're going to pray as a church and uh, yeah, we're going to pray over them. Um, D, why don't you just, Judah, can you grab the other mic? Just grab the other mic and give it to your mum. It's at the end there. Yeah. I've asked Niels and Chris to represent the board uh, of elders, and they're going to they're lay hands, but we're going to pray for them. Why don't you just stretch out your hand towards it? This is one of the things you may never do, but how about just for today, <laughs> you do that for me and for them as well. Dee, why don't you pray first, and then I'll pray. Lord, we thank you for this incredible couple. Lord, we can't use adequate words to describe this bittersweet moment, Lord, and and you know the many, many layers that are, that are attached to this moment, this stepping out from one into another season for them. Lord, I thank you for all they have been to this church community over the years. I thank you for the many, many, many lives that have been impacted by this couple by Paul and Jessica and their family and what they've brought to this church. Lord, I thank you for the the many people who are in this church because of them. I thank you for the many people who have made you their Lord and Savior through their ministry here, Lord Jesus. And we give them rightful honor for that, Lord. But we also, Lord, pray a blessing over them as they step into their next new season. Lord, that they'll have the freedom to fully step into that season. And for all that it has for them, Lord, may they be a blessing to those who are to join them on their journey. But I thank you for their friendship and their continued friendship as it will continue, Lord. And I just pray that you bring a flourishing into their lives in this season right now as they rest over the summer, Lord, and as they step into their new In Jesus' name, amen. 
Father, we thank you for them. We thank you for what they have been, for who they are, and God, for what they're going to bring to Lakeview and who you, you are going to change both of them into. As they, as they lead the church, as they minister, God, I pray that, that they will be loved there as they're loved here. Uh, God, we, we thank you for what you have brought. That you, we thank you that you brought them into our lives as a family as well, as Dee has said. But God, we pray and we are believing for, that for them and for us, the best is yet to come. That what is in front will far exceed what is behind. And we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Do you want to say anything, Jessica? You've been very quiet sure God I pray for Jessica particularly God so often she's been seen behind in the, the quiet but God we know that there is strength there is a steely resolve and God I pray that you more than ever will begin to fulfill the secret desires that have been on her heart the promises that maybe you've put there many years ago God that you will bring them back to her mind and that you will fulfill the things that even she has been waiting for. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Before we, before we sit down, Paul's asked that we sing the blessing. And, and uh, Darcy's going to lead us in that. But one of the things that you know, I've been saying over the years is that I want us to leave not just, hey, that was a great service, but leave commissioned. And one of the commissions, one of our commissions, is to bring people to Jesus. Not just to church, but to Jesus. But church is that place where there's that extra presence. There's, it's, it happens in a different way. And so as we, as we head out today and every other Sunday, let's pray together. God, I pray as we head into our week, into our workplace, our families, our places of education, God, whatever it is that we have in this week coming up, our holidays, God, I pray that you give us firstly an opportunity to speak about you and to invite people here. But I pray, God, also beyond that, that you'll give us courage to step into those opportunities when we see them. And God, I pray that you give us wisdom to know what to say. In the name of Jesus. Church, be blessed. Don't forget, after the service, we're going to gather in common ground. I want to encourage you to be there. There's a couple of cards that you can write your blessings and thanks to Paul and Jessica and the family and uh, grab a piece of cake as well. So don't rush off. Be part of community. that Paul and Jessica want to leave you with. Want to leave you with this blessing.
thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and your children may his presence go before you and beside you and behind you all around you and within you he is for you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming in your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you oh, 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 amen. 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 The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Be blessed as you go. Everybody, please join us in the lobby. Say goodbye to Paul and Jessica.